Well, last week, uh, Californians rejected Proposition 37, and what that would have done if passed would have mandated that uh, food companies tell the consumer, those of us who buy the food, whether that food has been genetically modified. Our guest is uh, Dr. Phil Howard. He is an associate professor at uh, the Department of Community Agriculture, Rec- uh, Recreation, and Resource Studies at the Michigan State University. Uh, Phil, how you doing? Good. How about you? Good. Tell me, this was a pretty big deal in the sense that, uh, and again, Proposition 37 was only in California. It wasn't nationwide, of course. But uh, the defeat of this proposition means what for us, the consumers? Well, it means we still won't have labeling of genetically engineered foods in this country, unlike 50 or 60 other countries in the world. And uh, California would have made a big, big difference. I mean, um, it's such a huge state that food manufacturers wouldn't have been able to produce labels just for California. It would have spread throughout the United States. Well, what's the opposition to uh, food producers letting us know whether a food is uh, pretty much organic or, or genetically modified? What's the opposition? Well, it's similar to the Battle of Trans Fats uh, years ago, uh, not too long ago. The government started requiring labeling of trans fats, and people stopped buying it. They, that was something they wanted to avoid. Uh, and as a result, companies had to reformulate their products. And uh, so now there are less trans fats in the U.S. food supply as a result. Uh, but it would have cost them more money to start sourcing foods that weren't genetically engineered. So you mean they'd have to actually um, have more natural foods? <laughs> I mean, is that the, is that the deal? Um, well, natural is kind of a slippery term, but um, you know, people expect that if it, it is natural, that it the ingredients have not been genetically engineered. But uh, when people start seeing a label that the food contains genetically engineered ingredients, uh, they're going to look for alternatives. And so as a result, companies would basically have to uh, stop sourcing genetically engineered corn and soy and cotton and canola oil. Uh, They would have to uh, find some alternatives. For those of us who don't know much about this issue of uh, genetically modified uh, food uh, stuffs, what what does that mean? It means that uh, the plant, uh, it's, it's typically plants at this point, uh, has been uh, engineered to contain a gene uh, often from a foreign organism. So a Roundup Ready soybean, soybean that's been engineered to withstand the Roundup herbicide, it contains genes from a bacteria and a petunia, um, so that it's able to withstand those uh, pesticides. And one might ask, what's wrong with that? Well, some people are concerned that there might be some potential health effects. There, there hasn't been a lot of long-term studies. Um, most of the studies that, that are done that are required by the U.S. government are very short-term, and they're conducted by the companies themselves. So uh, the FDA relies on self-reporting from the companies and just has to trust that, uh, that those figures are correct. Has there been any indication, let's say, in overseas studies uh, of the effect of eating uh, genetically modified food? Yeah, there have been studies uh, conducted in Russia and France and Scotland, all of which uh, with rodents suggest that there might be some uh, harmful effects from eating foods that have been genetically engineered. Um, Those studies have all received a lot of criticism from people who are very strong proponents of genetic engineering. Uh, so it's all very controversial, uh, but it does raise a lot of concerns for people who are um, you know, eating these products to know that, that there hasn't been enough study. So what kinds of things have these studies indicated that might affect, uh, or at least in these studies, they affected the, uh, the rodents? Uh, uh, the rodents would die sooner. They would have uh, internal organs that would be much larger uh, than the control rodents. Um, they would have tumors, all those types of things. So, uh, obviously, very un- well, in those studies, it appears the rodents who consumed this food uh, either became unhealthy or continued to be unhealthy. Yeah, um, the challenge is it's very expensive to do those types of studies. Uh, it often involves very small numbers. Um, so it's easy for uh, people who are very pro-genetic engineering to say, well, that could be due to chance. Um, So what's really needed is some more expensive, longer-term studies that are conducted, uh, you know, by independent scientists, not by the companies that stand to benefit financially from these products. 
Now, I've heard the argument uh, with uh, uh, genetically modified food that uh, it, um, it helps grow more food. Uh, it's the kind of food that uh, uh, is resistant, as you mentioned before, to certain herbicides. Uh, it's resistant to certain other things that might kill off that plant. Um, and that um, it's better because uh, it helps people who might have issues with hunger. Uh, what do you think? What do you say about those comments? Uh, I think both those arguments are pretty weak. Um, there have been a number of studies that show uh, Roundup Ready soybeans, for example. Uh, people always infer that they have higher yields, but they actually don't. They actually are basically equivalent or even lower than, than soybeans that are not genetically engineered. And the reason farmers have adopted them in huge numbers is it does make management easier. If you want a field that doesn't have any weeds in it, it's a lot easier to just spray over the entire crop and kill everything except that the crop you're trying to grow. Um, the, the argument that uh, you know, it's going to feed the world, uh, most of these foods that are genetically engineered are not going to poor people in developing nations. They're going to feed livestock, uh, which is consumed in more affluent nations. Right. The livestock meaning um, uh, cows and uh, cows cattle. Cows and pigs and, yeah. and chickens, yeah. And, of course, that's the th- kind of th- kinds of things we eat. Right. Which it passes through the system. Mm-hmm. And what happens then? Well, with that, again, we don't really know. There haven't been long-term studies of, um, you know, you know, just the effects of consuming genetically engineered corn and soybeans, let alone... Uh, you know, beef or chicken from uh, animals that have been fed those genetically engineered uh, products. Do you think most Americans, um, and we do consume a lot of food, uh, are truly aware of, first of all, uh, the food structure in that? Who owns what in this country? Uh, We tend to think of farms and farmers and, you know, someplace with a silo and a big barn and a bunch of cows. But it's really not that way, is it? No, not at all. Um, this is something I, t- I talk about to, to audiences pretty frequently, and they're all pretty shocked. Um, you know, there are so many name brands out there, uh, but it's not at all clear that a much smaller number of big corporations own many of those brands. So uh, you might look on a, a store shelf and see Le Choy brand of Chinese food and uh, Chun King brand of Chin- Chinese food and think, oh, I have two choices. But really, they're both owned by ConAgra. So some of the big companies are like uh, Monsanto, Coca-Cola, ConAgra, Nestle, Kraft, right? Right. And uh, how much market share do these um, five companies, to your knowledge, do these five companies own? Uh, I don't know that. Uh, Monsanto is involved uh, kind of further up the chain in uh, the seeds and chemicals. Uh, but I... I uh, estimate that the top 10 food and beverage companies in the U.S. control about a third of the food supply. About one-third of all sales come from just 10 corporations. Just 10? Yeah. So these are multi-billion dollar corporations? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're huge. Now, are these international corporations or just national corporations? Uh, both. Uh, some, like Nestle, are based in uh, uh, Switzerland. Um, but others are based in the United States. Um, but, you know, they're increasingly uh, global. Um, you know, they're all over the world, and, you know, they may not see themselves uh, in terms of where they're based. They see themselves as global corporations. Well, how do you see um, the situation that we as American consumers face? We, we certainly eat a lot of packaged food, a lot of prepared meals. Uh, we're probably busier than most others in the, in the developed world, and we we tend to rely on processed and prepared foods. Um, where are we as far as knowing uh, how our food is produced, where it comes from, uh, and, and what's in it? Yeah, we don't know very much. Uh, in fact, um, oftentimes it takes a crisis like a food contamination incident, uh, foods like spinach that were contaminated with E. coli or eggs with salmonella, uh, and recalls that are issued by the Food and Drug Administration before we can actually find out where that food is coming from. Um, And we had no idea that half a billion eggs in the United States um, that were recalled were coming from just two farms in the same county in Iowa. Um, So uh, things are really hidden from us in terms of where it's grown, uh, who's involved in producing it, um, 
you know, all the steps involved, uh, you know, before it gets to that supermarket shelf where we buy it. Now, what's your specialty uh, in studying this aspect of our food, uh, our food consumption? Uh, I look uh, frequently at, at consolidation in these industries, the mergers, acquisitions, uh, the str- strategic alliances that are consolidating uh, the food system and placing control into fewer and fewer hands. And again, we as consumers uh, pretty much see uh, some pretty packaging, you know, some high gloss stuff on the shelves, um, and thinking we're getting a variety. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, you know, when I talk to people, they're always surprised that there aren't, aren't some kind of regulations that require uh, corporate ownership to be disclosed, um, particularly in the organic industry. Uh, corporations go to great lengths to kind of hide their corporate parentage. And uh, you know, people have no idea that some of these uh, pioneering organic brands that they've been uh, placed a lot of trust in and have been buying for years have been acquired by some of these big corporations like Nestle, Kraft, and General Mills. Well, regarding organics, uh, to my understanding, isn't there some kind of federal uh, regulation of what is termed or what is called organic? Yeah, uh, all corporations that, uh, you know, any food manufacturers that, that sell organic food have to meet these uh, minimum standards that are defined by the federal government. Um, so, uh, you know, from that perspective, you know, organic is organic, whether it's coming from, you know, a General Mills or a, a smaller independent company. Uh, but when we were talking about Prop 37 earlier, uh, that kind of illustrated uh, for consumers what happens uh, when they buy a product that they don't know who really owns it. I mean, they're basically supporting a company like um, uh, ConAgra that uh, you know, is giving money, uh, spending a lot of money to try and defeat this initiative to allow people to know what's in their food. But also uh, in, uh, in the defeat of Proposition 37 is that, uh, again, uh, there won't be mandatory labeling of uh, genetically modified uh, food products. Uh, does it also mean uh, that uh, – and, and this reminds me of – the remember the milk debate uh, when there was the issue of – at one time, to my understanding, uh, when uh, some dairy farmers were saying we, we, we want to put on, on our label our milk – uh, I think it was um, no bovine uh, growth BGH? Hormone. Yeah. Bovine growth hormone? Yeah, there was a, a genetically engineered recumbent bovine growth hormone, and a lot of smaller regional dairies uh, wanted to label it as RBGH-free. Even the what's now a huge um, um, division of, of Unilever, uh, Ben & Jerry's, they wanted to label RBGH-free on their products, and the federal government said, no, you're not allowed to do that because that would uh, imply that there's something wrong with the products that, that do contain those. Um, it does come from cows that have been receiving those, those growth hormones. But overall, it's my understanding now they can put that on there, right? Or, or what's the deal? Yeah, I'm not sure of the latest. I think there've been, that been, that's been challenged pretty strongly and it's gone, you know, various, uh, um, you know, it's been challenged at the FDA, it's been right. challenged in the courts, and I'm not sure where it is now. But I, I do think um, you can make claims that are, are not as, as strong as the ones they used to make, but you can, you can make it a little more obvious that you're avoiding those, those products. But also, we've got about a minute left uh, during that time period, I think it was about 10, 12 years ago, uh, when uh, these cows uh, were receiving the BGH, um, they were getting this growth hormone, but it was causing other problems, right? Yeah, a huge number of problems for the cows. Uh, they were uh, more sick. Um, you know, the milk had higher levels of uh, the IGF-1, which is uh, known to promote cancer in human beings. Um, and uh, But it was really pressure from consumers um, that has caused a, a lot of uh, producers to move away from that product. But also the product was supposed to, again, help them produce more milk, right? But yeah, it was causing it, it, infections. It, 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 yeah, it did do that, but the irony was that at the same time, uh, the federal government was paying farmers to produce less milk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's something we have to talk about, too. We're talking with uh, Dr. Phil Howard, Michigan State University, talking about food. And coming up next, organic food and uh, what uh, Phil has uh, uh, taken a look at regarding the organic industry structure. We'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you. 
You're listening to the American edition of The Voice of Russia. I'm Rick Young in Washington. Online from Lansing, Michigan, Dr. Phil Howard of Michigan State University. He's an expert uh, in uh, food systems. And also we're talking about why uh, California's Proposition 37 failed. And that was a um, uh, proposition that would, uh, was asking whether uh, Californians would want to have uh, their food labeled non-genetically modified. Uh, again, that did not, um, uh, that did not pass. Uh, Phil, overall, you you've put together a what's called an organic industry structure, and uh, it's pretty it's, it's pretty interesting in that a lot of the um, companies that we believe we we know are organic and they are, but they've been acquired by these huge corporations. Yeah, that's right. Um, there are companies like Kellogg and Kraft and General Mills that uh, have been very active um, in acquiring you know, very well-known organic brands. Um, you know, this was a way for them to get into an industry that was growing very rapidly, um, and people were willing to pay a price premium for these products. Um, so they kind of bought their way into the industry and acquired a lot of brands that uh, uh, were well-known to consumers, but um, they didn't ever disclose this ownership. I mean, if you look on the package of uh, a General Mills product like Cascadian Farm Cereal, you won't see the big G, the General Mill symbol that they put on the, all their other products. Well, um, these major companies are obviously uh, looking at the smaller organic companies who go in, in, in some respects, I think, as you write, uh, for one reason. They want to really create uh, good, healthy food and, and, and keep much of the value in there. Uh, but some have regretted that they've sold out to the larger companies. Um. Yeah, there are people like Greg Stelton Pohl from Odwalla, which was acquired by Coca-Cola, who uh, talk about how you know they were pretty naive about thinking that uh, they weren't selling out, that Coca-Cola was buying in. But within a few years, um, you know, they were they were much less idealistic. And um, you know, Odwalla is a good example. That was something that they had a lot of organic products, uh, but after being taken over by Coca-Cola. Uh, they don't have any organic products anymore. And consumers who've been buying that brand for years um, and who don't look at the labels closely uh, continue to associate Odwalla with being uh, you know, an organic brand, but it's, it's really not anymore. So can you tell us how it's not? Uh, they just don't even use organic ingredients. So even though um, you could probably still call it a natural brand, you'll fi- find it in natural food stores, um, they just use um, conventional fruits and vegetables uh, that they put in their juice. Well, again, you've studied this. Um, give me an idea. Um, when these companies form, m- many of these original organic companies, what was their intent? Obviously, they wanted to make money, but what was the other intent there? Well, the original organic companies um, were very mission-driven. Um, you know, a lot of those founders uh, were very idealistic, um, often very charismatic, and they were interested in, uh, you know, some of them said they wanted to change the food system. And some of them have continued to do that. They've uh, on very, been very principled about refusing buyout offers. And uh, I've tracked about 18 organic brands that have remained independent uh, and that are, you know, have been around a long time, are distributed nationally, um, have millions of dollars in sales. And I know all of them are getting um, frequent buyout offers often, you know, really inflated prices for what's typical in the food industry. So it takes a lot of dedication um, to really refuse those type of offers. Uh, one example is Gary Erickson of Cliff Bar. He walked away from $60 million in cash um, to be bought out by Quaker Oats, which is a division of Pepsi. And it was because he really um, was worried that the company, like others who've been taken over, uh, wouldn't continue to embody the values that he was trying to embody in the you know, make the changes he was trying to make in the food system. So tell us the, tell us the type of changes he was trying to make compared to what might ha- might happen if there's a corporate takeover. Uh, one of the things he's done is to try to increase the percentage of organic ingredients. Uh, his, his product is an energy bar. Um, so at the time that they were nearly acquired, about 70% of their ingredients were organic. And they've tried to continue to increase that. Um, he's... Uh, done things like using renewable energy, um, you know, reducing uh, the packaging, all those type of things. Um, He was worried that um, it might actually go in the other direction, which is very common when a company is acquired, that they reduce their commitment to organic ingredients. 
reduce their commitment to uh, local and national farmers and start sourcing from China and Brazil where it's a lot cheaper uh, to buy those products, those ingredients. Um, so those were, were some of the things he was trying to um, you know, continue to do, which he couldn't if he had been, been acquired. So we can think then uh, of the reverse if a major company came in and, and took over a company like his. And reverse, yeah. but I mean, obviously not organic products, possibly outsourcing the labor, that kind of thing. Yeah, a good example of this is uh, White Wave Silk uh, Soy Milk. When that was acquired by Dean, uh, they almost immediately started sourcing soybeans from China and Brazil. Uh, they were criticized for that, so they backtracked and started soy s sourcing their organic beans from the U.S., but pretty soon after that, they they did something else, which was take a product that was organic and change it to just a natural product. So they started, you know, going back to using conventional soybeans uh, from China in this product, but they didn't change anything on the packaging except that fine print on the ingredients list. They didn't change the UPC code. And a lot of retailers didn't even realize this change and were still advertising it as an organic product. Is it really possible nowadays for a small company, small organic company, to stay organic in the midst of uh, price cutting and uh, multi-billion dollar ad campaigns or multi-million dollar ad campaigns by the larger companies that might own another organic company? It's a real challenge. A lot of uh, people who have founded uh, these pioneering companies that have remained independent have said that it would be nearly impossible if they were starting out today. Uh, one of the issues is distribution. Distribution is pretty much monopolized by one or two firms uh, in the organic and natural foods industry. So um, to be able to, to get to, from being a small company and distributing locally uh, to distributing nationally is an impossible jump. And that's why you see some more recent startups like Honesty uh, you know, making a, a very deliberate choice to be acquired by a company like Coca-Cola, which... Uh, Without doing that, there was no way they could get onto the store shelves across the country. So when we talk about big food uh, in this country, I mean, we're talking um, a company or, or, or a number of companies that really control the food supply from farming all the way up to uh, when it hits the shelves. Yeah, that's, um, you know, a company like ConAgra, for example, um, would actually brag uh, years ago about um, – from the farm gate to the dinner plate. Uh, that was their motto. Um, and then you have uh, other companies that may not be quite so vertically integrated um, from the farm to the retailer, but uh, are using things like joint ventures and strategic alliances to uh, form what my colleagues at the University of Missouri call a food chain cluster. Uh, an example would be Monsanto and Cargill uh, with Monsanto controlling the, the the seeds and the fertilizers and the pesticides, and then Cargill controlling um, things beyond that, such as collecting the grain, processing the grain, uh, feeding the grain to livestock, and, and that type of thing. And so there's a concern that uh, when you have a system like that, there, are, there aren't markets at every stage like there used to be. Um, it's more of a, a seamless system where um, you know, there's no, no competition to reduce costs for consumers. Um, and we end up as consumers eventually with paying much higher prices for food as a result. And, of course, that's the bottom line. Is, well, that is the bottom line for most of these companies, right? It's not uh, – I'm not saying all companies are this way, but uh, even organic companies want to make a profit. But it, really, with the, with the major corporations, it's, it's the size of the profit, right? Yeah, particularly if you're a publicly traded firm. Um, you know, there's pressure from shareholders, um, pressure from the board. Uh, for the CEO to continually increase profits every quarter. Uh, that's a pretty big, big, big task um, and it often requires, at this stage, um, reducing the prices paid to farmers. Uh, farmers get, um, you know, have to pay more and more for inputs. Uh, they're often getting less and less uh, for the, the products that they're creating um, as consumers. Um, you know, in the United States, we pay less than 10% of our incomes on average on food, including eating out. Um, but, you know, with, with the companies being involved, needing to increase profits, um, there are some categories where we're seeing prices starting to rise, like beer, 
uh, which was, um, you know, used to be a very regional industry. Uh, now we have, you know, two European-based firms that control about 80% of the beer. After InBev, which is based in Belgium, Belgium took over Anheuser Busch. They immediately started raising prices on beer in the United States. So uh, that's something we can probably expect to see more of as uh, more of these acquisitions occur. And for the simple reason, too, they assume uh, or they acquire so much debt uh, to buy these companies. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it takes, they often have to find outside financing from banks um, to, to buy those companies. InBev um, you know, had to kind of scour the globe to find uh, the billions of dollars it cost to acquire Anheuser-Busch. And, um, yeah, they immediately started cutting costs wherever they could, selling off um, SeaWorld and um, – eliminating the corporate jets, and, um, um, but most importantly for us is uh, raising the prices on their products. But in these huge buyouts, uh, especially for um, uh, the food industry or beverage industry, who really makes the money? I mean, uh, we're talking shareholders, yes, but aren't these executives making, I mean, millions? Yeah, in some cases, tens of millions per year. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't think shareholders have nearly as much power as uh, we are led to believe. Uh, it's often the, the CEO uh, who, you know, whether the, the company does well or doesn't do well, end up making, you know, pretty huge, huge amounts of money. Uh, and some of the higher level executives are in a similar situation. Um, the boards, too, often receive huge amounts of compensation. Um, so as a result, they are not really in a position to you know, challenge what the CEO is doing. Let's talk about uh, farmers and farming. Again, we, we tend to think of, uh, you know, a guy having a, a farm in the family for several generations, and he's either got pigs or cattle, cows, uh, various, you know, livestock. Uh, but that's not really the case any longer. I think the past 40 years or so, we've seen the decline of the, uh, of the small American farmer. Yeah, at the turn of the century... Um, you know, over two-thirds of people in the United States uh, lived and worked on farms. Um, now we have less than 2% of the population engaged in farming. So there's been a long, steady decline in farming. Um, at the same time, it's become uh, much less diverse, much more specialized. You see a lot more monoculture where, where farmers will grow hundreds and hundreds of acres, if not thousands of acres, of the same product. Or if they're involved in livestock production, you know, instead of having um, animals dispersed across um, you know, large amounts of land, they're packed into small buildings. Um, and and you know, it's to the point where um, if you want to go into these buildings, you have to shower in and out because the animals are, are so susceptible to, to getting sick. So give me an example of what um, uh, a... I guess a small or regular family farm would look like. As you mentioned, there's a variety of animals there. It's open space. Give me a comparison to a corporate farm. Well, although um, you know, there's still a lot of uh, family farms out there, the, the scale of them, the ones that remain, is so much different. Um, there are some farms that are owned by corporations. Uh, you know, in, in California particularly, there are um, pretty huge uh, industrialized operations where they actually um, use a laser to level the fields so that it's perfectly flat. They use uh, machines that uh, mechanically harvest the entire crop. Um, you know, it's, it's a far cry from, you know, somebody with 40 acres who's growing, uh, you know, dozens if not hundreds of different crops. And this is all, again, done to make, uh, as some say, farming more efficient, uh, to uh, supply America with more food, uh, some of it genetically modified, and it's all about more and more, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's the, the singular goal, um, you know, efficiency, um, higher production. Uh, but what that often leaves out is the, the negative externalities, the, the costs on the environment, the cost to communities. Um, so... Although you know the food itself may be cheap as a result of, of this uh, you know changes in farming, uh, we pay a lot as taxpayers to subsidize all the technologies and even direct payments that go into the system. Uh, we pay in the, the pollution 
uh, you know, the, the leaches into the water and is uh, impacting the Gulf of Mexico, for example. We pay in our health when we're, um, you know, eating these, these products that uh, have been changed to the point where they're not very good for us. Um, you know, high fructose corn syrup is a relatively recent invention that's kind of swept the, the food supply uh, and it's been implicated in rising rate, rates of diabetes, uh, heart disease, uh, obesity, things like that. Got a couple of minutes left. You got about uh, three and a half minutes left. You also talked about, uh, in one of your articles, you talked about um, how retailers position their stores close to schools, right? Uh, yeah, there are um, convenience stores and fast food restaurants um, are found uh, at much, you know, they're found more near schools in much higher rates than you would expect if they were just distributed randomly. And uh, we know that um, students before and after school uh, will go to these places, buy food that is not, is not uh, very healthy for them. And uh, there's, there's some evidence to suggest that uh, schools that are closer to convenience stores and fast food restaurants have higher rates of obesity than, than schools that don't. And obviously you think that's a deliberate um, uh, effort to make sure that you get at least some foot traffic near these stores, which of course sell um, you know, uh, fatty foods, uh, snacks, things like that. Yeah, I think some of it's deliberate. Uh, fast food nation, Eric Schlosser, talks about uh, Ray Kroc, the guy who turned McDonald's into a global, uh, you know, huge corporation. He used to um, uh, fly a Cessna uh, around California looking for where new high schools were being built, and that's where he would locate the new McDonald's. And one might say, well, that's just, you know, it's just business. It's smart business. We're going to put the product where they believe uh, the consumer wants to have it. But then when we're talking about um, targeting young people uh, who aren't thinking about food choices or what's best, they just they basically think about what's good for them. What about the issue of taking soft, uh, soft drinks out of high schools, as many, many have done? What do you think about that? Yeah, that's becoming a lot more common. Um, you know, there are a lot of schools that, get revenue from companies to have exclusive contracts with a Coke or a Pepsi. Um, so it's been very difficult to challenge that. Um, but at least some schools have moved away from, um, you know, they've replaced some of Coke and Pepsi's uh, least healthy products, uh, those, you know, sugary soft drinks, and they replaced them with things like juices and bottled water. Um, so, um, you know, that is starting to have an impact on on uh, you know, the availability of, of unhealthy foods for students. And obviously that was done because of public outcries over uh, the rates of childhood obesity. Uh, we've been talking with uh, Dr. Phil Howard. He is with Michigan State University. We're talking about the food that you buy, what it looks like, what it's supposed to look like, and, and what's in it. And, Phil, let's talk more about the Cornucopia Institute. You've written for them before, and you've written several articles uh, regarding um, some of the attacks on the American consumer regarding food. We'll, help, we'll deal with that when we come back. You're listening to the American edition of The Voice of Russia. I'm Rick Young in Washington. On the line from Lansing, Michigan, Dr. Phil Howard. Uh, he's with Michigan State University, and he's an expert in uh, food distribution. But also, uh, Phil, we're talking about uh, what we should know about uh, what goes into our food and how it's labeled You've done some uh, articles for the Cornucopia Institute. Uh, I have, uh, in, they've interviewed me, and I've written some articles for some uh, other organizations. Okay. Uh, but I was looking at this website. It promotes economic justice for the family-scale farmer. Um, again, when we get back to when we say family-scale, what does that mean? Uh, it's tough to define because there are a lot of elements that go into it. Um, you need to look at ownership. Um, you know, are they hiring outside labor? Um, scale, how big is the operation. Um, but typically we're, we're expecting that the majority of the labor comes from the family um, and then it's, it's a, you know, a, that size of an operation. And we've, we've kind of we've gone over just pretty much what um, uh, genetically modified food is, uh, why, how it might not be good for us, uh, how the, um, the big food corporations pretty much control the main uh, from 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 the farmer uh, from the farm all the way to the grocery store, 
let's talk about what we can do as consumers in the in the food choices that we make. Um, you know, we're, we're in a bit of a recession for, for many people, a uh, pretty bad recession for some people. Um, when we look at our food, what should we be looking at right now? Where we shop, how we shop, what? Well, there are a lot of things that we can do. Um, some of them are more difficult than others. Um, you know, it, it sounds difficult, but starting to grow some of your own food is one of the best things you can do. Um, even if you don't have a lot of space, growing some sprouts uh, is a way to get started in that. Uh, buying food directly from a farmer um, so you know where it's coming from at, say, a farmer's market or a roadside stand. You can begin to have conversations with the farmer about the practices they use um, to see if those align with your values. Um, you know, not everybody has time to do that. Uh, you know, farmer's markets often have limited hours. Um, so, it, you know, kind of at the other end of the spectrum, it's just trying to find out more about who's really producing that food. Uh, one good resource is called Good Guide, G-O-O-D, guide.org. Um, you can look up uh, about 22,000 different food products. Um, in some cases, you can find out who really owns it. But you, all, you also can also see health, social, and environmental scores for how that product compares to others in that same category. And that can help you choose something that um, you wouldn't otherwise know is, is better um, you know, for the community than um, then you, you know, because a lot of that information is hidden from us. Um, you know, just on my own web, own website, I have, uh, you know, a list of 18 independent organic food companies. Uh, so people who, uh, want to support companies that, you know, for example, support knowing if products are, uh, genetically engineered, um, you know, you can support those companies rather, and then you can try to avoid uh, your Cascadian farms and your Muir Glens that are owned by uh, General Mills, which contributed money to prevent people from knowing what's in their food. And what's your website? It's uh, it's difficult to describe because there's a tilde symbol in it, uh, but if you you know just search for Phil Howard, uh, it will be in the one of the top few results. At Michigan State University, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, also, uh, when, when you talk about, uh, you said Cascadian Farms, and, and these are familiar labels to me, and again, I was not aware that they were owned by General, General Mills, you said? Right. Um, how does one know? Let's say one goes to a natural food store, and you, you look around, and you think, hey, this is great stuff. Uh, you know, this says, this has, this doesn't have this, this doesn't have that. It seems like it's healthy. But again, there's no indication, unless there's very fine print, that says it's owned by a major corporation. Yeah, and you usually won't even find that. Um, you know, Kellogg, for example, has a product called Bare Naked, which they acquired in 2007. It's a granola. Yeah. You can even go to the Bare Naked website, and it will say Bare Naked is a trademark of Bare Naked. It will have a timeline, of, uh, you know, that the company was founded by two childhood friends in their kitchen. Uh, it won't say anything about Kellogg anywhere. Um, so it's it's very difficult for consumers to know who they're really supporting. Um, you know, unless they go to my website or Cornucopia or something like the Organic Consumers Association and are, are reading articles where they, they find this out, uh, they just have no way of knowing who really owns it. Do we in this country, especially this country, because uh, we're on the go so much and uh, commutes are getting longer and uh, families are not eating the way they used to, uh, is it that our lifestyle is creating this demand for processed food, uh, fast food, uh, or is it that we have just gotten to the point that um, uh, we don't want to do what we used to do before, look for good food and cook good food? Uh, I wouldn't put all the blame on us because, um, you know, we have big corporations that, as we were talking about earlier, need to increase their profits every quarter. Uh, so they have very deliberately convinced us that we don't need to know how to cook certain foods, that it's easier to buy something um, that's already frozen or it's in a box and, and doesn't take many additional ingredients. Um, so they've uh, basically uh, spent a lot of money on advertising and other things to convince us um, to let our skills uh, in food preparation uh, become weaker and weaker. Uh, you know, they've de-skilled us to the point where we find it hard to conceptualize um, what to do with the stuff that we, we buy at the farmer's market. Um, so, you know, I do think, um, you know, things are, 
things are hectic and it's hard for people who are working two or three jobs to uh, go to the farmer's market and make something from scratch. But, um, you know, part of that is the industry itself convincing us that, that, that their alternative is, is better for us. Now, is, are, is one of the solutions to, uh, to this issue of uh, just massive corporate control of our food system, is one of the answers cooperatives? Definitely. I mean, uh, cooperatives are, um, you know, retailers that are owned by the people who shop there. Um, and buying a, in, into being an owner of that cooperative is often relatively inexpensive. Um, you know, some of them it's around $20 a year to be a member. Um, and then, you know, as a member, you get, you can uh, order things in bulk, you can get lower prices, um, and you can also have a say in, in how that retailer is operated. So, um, you know, these historically have come from uh, some of the first co-ops were in England where people really wanted to take control over the, the foods and other products they were buying and banded together, formed a cooperative, uh, and created a, you know, that form of business. And, you know, in other places of the world, cooperatives are much more prevalent. Um, you know, in, in places like France and Germany and Italy, uh, there are a lot of retailers that are cooperatively owned. A lot of uh, producers uh, form cooperatives to sell their products. But at this point, there are no real threat to the major corporations. Um, not, not in retail in the United States. There are um, only a few hundred co-ops, and their share of the market is uh, really, really tiny compared to a company like Whole Foods, uh, which is, uh, you know, very huge in the, the organic and natural foods retailing sector. What about the issue of fair trade organizations and the and the and the types of foods that they they supply us, uh, and, and you mentioned in, in one of your articles regarding cooperatives and how they um, how they are, they do work with uh, fair trade organizations. What is a fair trade organization? Well, fair trade is an initiative to give uh, producers in developing nations in the global south uh, better, you know, a way to compete with with bigger producers. So. For example, they, it will often reduce the number of steps from the producer to the consumer. It's a more direct form of trade. Uh, there are minimum prices that are paid for products. Um, and for some uh, fair trade products uh, like coffee and, and um, um, some other products on the, in the international system, uh, the, they have to come from cooperatives. So um, it's a way for um, you know, consumers in places like Europe, uh, North America, Japan, to support smaller producers and, and help them compete against the, the big plantations. But when one sees uh, maybe a label that says a uh, member of a fair trade organization or I've, certain, uh, I've seen certain um, health food stores, organic uh, food stores, and they say um, uh, based upon a fair trade um, organization, uh, that could be pretty well trusted, can it? Um. Yeah, I, I, I encourage people to look for the Fair Trade International seal. There's also a small producer seal uh, that some producers in Mexico have developed recently. Uh, the challenge is that Fair Trade USA, which was the main uh, certification agency in the U.S., um, they've kind of uh, been very sympathetic to big corporations like Starbucks, and they've actually, um, you know, eliminated the 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 um, Requirement that coffee has to come from small producers that are in cooperatives. They they want to allow uh, the big plantations to get involved in, in the um, products that are labeled as fair trade. So um, you know I think there are a lot of consumers that are much more skeptical of uh, fair trade USA these days. Tell us what's the difference between natural food and organic food. Uh, it's something that I've had to wrestle with uh, in recent years. Not really sure what natural means anymore. Yeah, there's no uh, legal requirement for what natural means, although um, some companies have been challenged. Uh, Sprite, uh, not long ago, tried to label their product as natural because the, uh, the flavors were natural, uh, but yet they were sweetened with high fructose corn syrup, which is, um, you know, when people think of natural products, that's one of the things they're really trying to avoid is HFCS. So, uh, they actually backed down and stopped saying that Sprite was natural, but 
historically, if you went to a natural food store, uh, you were going, going to find products that did not contain high fructose corn syrup and did not contain hydrogenated uh, vegetable oils. Um, they didn't have artificial dyes and, and flavors and things like that. So there's kind of a uh, you know, common understanding that that's what natural means. Organic um, you know, is, is defined by the USDA and it requires the avoidance of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. Uh, for livestock, you can't use uh, artificial, you know, can't use growth hormones or um, antibiotics. So there are, you know, a huge list of requirements for foods to meet organic standards. Natural uh, becomes a lot fuzzier. Is that merely a, a, a labeling? Um, it's just a label, a commercial label? Uh, for some firms, definitely. I mean, you see people that are willing to pay a price premium if it's something's natural. So uh, there's a new cereal called Mom's Best, which is actually owned by Malto Meal. And that's where that's what the letters actually represent. M O M. It's not <laughs> it's not somebody's actual mom, um, but they they have moved into natural food stores because people are willing to pay higher prices, and they're simply um, you know making cereals that don't have um, you know synthetic uh, flavors and and colors and um, people are paying more. So, um, but I mean, I think there are other firms that have been in the natural foods industry for decades and, and have more of a commitment to, you know, providing people uh, an alternative to those, you know, HFCS and hydrogenated vegetable oil type products. So basically, though, um, corporations are looking at uh, organic companies uh, that cater to um, those who wish to have uh, organic food on their plate want to buy it, obviously uh, eat it. Uh, this is a very desired uh, demographic, isn't it? Yeah, and it's a growing demographic, too. Um, over three-quarters of all Americans uh, buy organic food, at least occasionally. Um, but there are people who you know, are willing to pay a premium for that. Um, they're, um, you know, they show a lot of loyalty to organic um, people, particularly for certain products like milk. Uh, parents of, of young children will go out of their way to buy organic milk and will pay pretty significant price premiums for it. So, um, you know, it's gone from 1% of the U.S. food supply to 4% um, in a very short period of time. Uh, and although, you know, those really rapid growth, late, growth rates of the late 90s, early 2000s have slowed, it's still growing faster than the conventional food industry. So, um, Big food corporations see that this isn't just a fad that's going to go away. It's something uh, they need to get involved in if they want to uh, continue to, to make big profits in this industry. But isn't it true that uh, the group that uh, buys organic products is a higher income, higher educated group? Well, um, that's evidence is a little mixed on that. Um, I mean, obviously, to be able to afford a price premium, you need a certain level of income. Uh, but some studies have found that... Um, uh, you know, lower income people are just as likely to buy organic food as more affluent people. But given the fact that it appears that uh, the more affluent are, are uh, certainly a desired um, group that uh, any major corporation would want because they have more disposable income, right? Yeah, yeah. And certainly um, you have to have a certain level of affluence to shop at a place like Whole Foods, uh, which has a huge percentage of organic products and, you know, a lot of natural products. You are a, I guess, a food distribution expert. You kind of, you know where food starts and how it ends up on our plates and how it ends up at the grocery store. What is the future of how we do business uh, regarding food in that? Uh, are we looking toward uh, greater consolidation of how we produce our food? Uh, I, see, I see it difficult to re reverse those trends. Um, you know, I think uh, there were – a number of workshops uh, in 2010 by, held by the Department of Justice and USDA that looked at consolidation in various sectors of the food system, primarily in production. Uh, but basically nothing came out of that. The, uh, after all the testimony and all the concerns about you know, how these, these uh, trends were impacting farmers, uh, they quietly re released a report that agreed there were all these problems, but said that uh, given the way that antitrust law is currently interpreted, uh, there's really nothing they can do. So I expect to see 
uh, particularly as um, if financing becomes more available, um, that there will be more and more acquisitions. And just briefly, uh, given the budget talks that are going on, um, do you see any cutback in the subsidies to the food industry? That's hard to say because the the, the farm lobby is so powerful. Um, it's you know they've been able to maintain subsidies um, even as the you know, the World Trade Organization has eliminated subsidies in a lot of other nations. So uh, I know there are various factions that really want to eliminate those and those that want to maintain them. Uh, and it's really hard to predict how that will turn out. Okay. We've been talking with Dr. Phil Howard, Associate Professor, Department of Community, Agriculture, Recreation, and Resource Studies at Michigan State University, East Lansing, Michigan. We've been talking about food distribution, organic versus natural, and uh, corporate farms versus family farms. Uh, good discussion, Phil. Uh, thanks for joining us here on the American Edition of The Voice of Russia. Thanks for having me. And we'll have you on again. Great. Thanks. Right. Have a good day. You too.